Okay, May, we're good to go. So whenever you want to start. Okay, we've got Facebook with us. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, welcome to our meeting tonight. This is the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association monthly general meeting. And we are glad to have everyone with us tonight. We have people both attending via Facebook and our members are on Zoom. Um, and um, we're just delighted to have you here with us tonight. Um, I'm May Smith, TAAA president, and we have tonight Jim Knoll and Terry Lappin, who are helping us with um, the technology and um, also with Facebook. And so they will be communicating with those of you who are on Facebook and conveying um, any questions that you have for our speakers or anything so that those will get answered. Um, we're going to ask people that um, that they stay uh, muted tonight during the presentation and the um, questions. You will be able, AAA members will be able to enter your questions in the chat. And as I said, Facebook can enter those through Facebook. Um, and we do ask that our members um, stop their video if they're doing anything moving around a lot in a way that might be distracting to people. Um, and if you have any comments or any needs, just mention those in the chat. Um, tonight with us, we have Dr. Mansfield, who you received some information about, um, who's associated with the University of Chicago, and she's done some really fascinating research, and you can tell just from her title for the topic that, um, that she's really very interesting in the way that she does things and thinks about things. So we expect to really enjoy her presentation tonight, A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Hot Galaxy. So um, Dr. Mansfield, if you're ready to, to screen share, we could start. Yeah, sounds good. Let me get that. Hold on. Um, yeah, so um, I'm Megan. It's great to be talking to you all tonight. Um, I'm uh, currently a postdoc at the University of Arizona. Um, I just moved here from Chicago just about six months ago. Um, so I'm new to Tucson and uh, I'm going to be talking about um, hot Jupiters today. Um, so first, I'll just give you guys a little bit of background on what hot Jupiters are, or um, in general, what exoplanets are. Hot Jupiters are a type of exoplanet. And then I'll talk a little about how we find hot Jupiters, um, why we want to study the atmospheres of these planets, which is what I do for my research. And then I'll tell you a little bit about some research that I've done to um, learn about these planets by looking at them with the Hubble Space Telescope. All right, so first, uh, what are exoplanets? So this might be background information for some of you, um, but exoplanets are um, basically just planets that are in any um, system outside of the solar system. So they orbit around other stars than our own star. Um, so we think that um, when our star formed, basically our star started as a giant cloud of gas, and then most of that gas condensed down and made our sun. Um, but then a little bit of that gas was left over in this kind of ring of gas and dust around the star. And then that um, leftover gas and dust formed into all of the planets that we have in our solar system now. And we think that a similar process happened around basically every star in the galaxy. So pretty much every star you see when you look up at the night sky has planets orbiting around it. Um, all right, so now what are hot Jupiters specifically? So um, in our solar system, of course, we've got um, eight lovely planets. Um, closest into the sun, we've got our four rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then further out from there, we've got the two gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and the two ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. And we classify these planets um, based on their size and also what they're made out of. So we call Jupiter a gas giant because it's much, much bigger than the Earth and most of it's um, made out of hydrogen and helium gas. So it's mostly a gaseous planet instead of being a solid rock like the Earth. So um, Jupiter in our solar system orbits the sun once every 12 years, um, whereas the closest in planet in the solar system, Mercury, orbits the sun once every 88 days. 
But what would happen if we took Jupiter and we just pushed it in so it was really close to the sun, even closer than Mercury? Um, so that's what we call a hot Jupiter. Um, they orbit their stars once every one to five days. So they're even 10 times closer into their stars than the closest planet in our solar system. So, um, of course, as you probably know, the closer you get to the sun, the more light the planet's going to be receiving, so the hotter it's going to be. So in our solar system, Venus is hotter than Earth, Mars is colder than Earth, and Jupiter's even colder than that. So you can imagine if you move a planet up to be 10 times closer than Mercury is to the star, it's going to get really, really hot. So that's why we call them hot Jupiters. Um, and these planets are really unlike anything that we have in our solar system. So the hottest known planet that we know of, the warmest hot Jupiter that we've ever discovered, has a temperature of about 6,700 degrees Fahrenheit. That's only about 1,500 degrees colder than our sun. So this planet is almost as hot as a star. Of course, that's the most extreme hot Jupiter, but your average like run of the mill hot Jupiter can still reach temperatures of about 2000 to 3000 degrees. So they're really toasting. And on a planet that's that hot, um, everything happens totally differently than the way you would expect from thinking about processes that happen in our solar system. Um, so here's an example of this cool uh, Halloween style um, movie poster that NASA made for a planet that's been discovered um, that's a hot Jupiter. And on this planet, instead of having clouds made out of um, like little pieces of water ice or snowflakes, things like that, the clouds are made out of blowtorched pieces of glass. And um, on other hot Jupiters we know of, um, if you went out on a walk in the hot Jupiter, instead of um, you know, having to bring an umbrella to keep yourself dry from raining water. Um, some of these planets, it rains liquid iron. Um, so they're really crazy compared to the solar system. Um, and also on some of these planets, um, they're so hot that um, they're actually, we think, losing their atmospheres to space. So some of these planets get so much light from their stars that their atmospheres heat up enough that all of that gas can escape out into space. So they might end up looking something like this um, artist's idea of what one of these planets would look like, where they have these almost comet-like tails of hydrogen and helium gas streaming off of the planet. So you might say, okay, this is like a cool idea for a planet, but these planets are so crazy, they can't possibly exist. Um, but we've actually discovered a fair amount of these planets. In fact, the first ever planet that was discovered orbiting a star kind of like our sun was a hot Jupiter. Um, so this planet was called 51 Pegasi b. And here in the top part of this uh, diagram, you can kind of see how the layout of the 51 Pegasi system compares to our own solar system. So this um, top bar up here shows the distances of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter from the sun. And then on the bottom here, you can see 51 Pegasi b right here, way close into its star much closer even than Mercury is to our sun. Um, if this planet sounds familiar to you, this discovery was actually um, the reason that two uh, astronomers, Michel Mayor and Didier Coloz, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2019, um, was for the discovery of this first ever known hot Jupiter. All right, so now I'll tell you a little bit about how we actually detect these hot Jupiters. Um, so in order to find these planets, we use something called the transit method. Um, and basically the way that works is that um, it, when we're looking at these systems, uh, some number of systems will just happen to be randomly oriented so that when we look from our point of view, um, the planet once in its orbit will cross in front of the star. Let me see if I can get this video going. There we go. Um, so it'll just so happen that sometimes we'll see the planet go in front of the star when we look at it with our telescope. And when we see that happen, um, we'll basically see a little bit less light from the star with our telescope for a little while, uh, because the planet will be blocking some of the light. And then when the planet goes out from blocking the star, then we'll see the amount of light return to normal. So we get these dips in the amount of light that we see in the star. And you'll see um, one dip every time the planet goes around in its orbit. So if we see this dip in the light coming from the star happening periodically, you know, once every few days, then we can know we've detected a planet around this star. Oops. Um, so 
it turns out that um, using this transit method um, is a really good way to detect hot Jupiters. Um, so this plot here shows all of the different planets we've detected now, um, and it's plotting their period here in days and their mass in Jupiter masses. So the hot Jupiters are going to be these planets that are orbiting with periods of one to a few days and have a mass about equal to that of Jupiter, maybe one or two Jupiter masses. Um, and the only color you need to worry about here, these are all different detection methods and this green, uh, these green boxes here are planets that have been discovered with that transit method. So we've actually detected about 400 hot Jupiters using this transit method, which is quite a lot. It turns out, though, that hot Jupiters are um, pretty rare, um, and this transit method is just biased towards detecting a lot of these hot Jupiters. Because um, if you think back to when um, we were watching, you know, the star go around or the planet go around the star, and you see that dip in the amount of light when the planet blocks part of the star. Um, if the planet's bigger, so if it's like Jupiter sized instead of the size of Earth, it's going to block more light, so it'll be easier to see. And close in planets are also easier to detect with this method because um, they will orbit faster, and so you have to look at the star less long to watch the planet go around several times and see it block the starlight several times. So instead of having to look at the star for two years if we wanted to see the Earth transit twice, we only have to look for like 10 days to see a hot Jupiter transit twice. So this method uh, gives us a lot of detections of hot Jupiters, even more than any other type of planet. And it turns out that we think actually these planets are pretty rare. Um, so maybe 1% of stars in our galaxy have a hot Jupiter. So our solar system isn't too weird because we don't have a hot Jupiter. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some research that I do looking at the atmospheres of these planets. Um, so first I want to describe how we actually study the atmospheres of hot Jupiters. Um, so we again use this transit method where we're watching the planet transit in front of the star. Um, so again, the planet's blocking some of the light from the star as it goes in front. But if you imagine that this planet also has a teeny tiny ring of atmosphere around it, then the planet's going to block some of the starlight and some of the starlight's going to go straight to your telescope, but a teeny bit of the starlight is going to get filtered through the planet's atmosphere. And so we can use that little bit of light that gets filtered through the atmosphere to um, help us understand what the atmosphere is made of, um, its temperature and stuff like that, so we can get an idea of what these planets are actually like. Um, so there's kind of two big reasons that we want to study um, the atmospheres of hot Jupiters. Um, so the first is that we'd like to understand more about how these planets form and evolve. Um, so like I said, we think planets form in these big disks of gas and dust that exist around stars when they're really young. But we don't know a lot of details of, for example, when exactly do these planets form? How do you end up with a system like the solar system? where we have inner rocky planets and an outer gas giant versus what happened like how do you end up with a hot Jupiter how did it get so close into the star um, and we can understand a little more about these formation processes by observing the compositions of these planets and the key measurement here that astronomers usually like to go for are oxygen and carbon abundances um, so as I said earlier hot Jupiters are gas giants so they're mostly made of hydrogen and helium but they have little bits of all of the other elements in there, including little bits of carbon and oxygen. And we can use measurements of the amount of carbon and oxygen they have to tell us a little bit more about where they might have formed, how far away they were from the star when they formed, and what might have happened to them since then. Like, did they um, form very far out and migrate closer into their star? Did they form very close into the star? Things like that. So then the second thing that we want to learn about these planets' atmospheres is we want to try and measure their thermal structures to understand more about planetary physics. So the thermal structure is basically just the temperature as a function of altitude in the atmosphere and also location. So if you've ever climbed up a really tall mountain, you'll notice that as you go up through the Earth's atmosphere, it gets colder. And then also the Earth has temperature differences at different latitudes and longitudes. The equator is very hot, the North Pole is very cold. And the same thing happens on hot Jupiters. They'll have different areas in their atmospheres, maybe higher up or lower down, or nearer the equator or nearer the pole that will be hotter, colder. 
And we can use measurements of those temperature structures to understand more about things like how do winds circulate heat around on these planets. Um, so, of course, if you're interested in studying um, giant planets, gas giants, then we've got two really great samples in our solar system, and we can send spacecraft to them to get really detailed information. So this is a picture of Jupiter from the Juno mission, which was sent there recently. And this is a picture of Saturn from the Cassini mission. So we can get these really beautiful detailed measurements of our solar system's planets um, instead of just relying on like this tiny point that's orbiting around a star several light years away. Um, but if we limit ourselves to the solar system, we're only looking at two planets around one star. So we're really looking at one outcome of what happens when planets form. When we look at hot Jupiters as well, we're looking at um, hundreds of different planets around hundreds of different stars. So this really gives us a way to say not just how did planets form in the solar system, but overall, how do planets usually form in the galaxy? And is our solar system unique or are we pretty standard for what's out there? All right, so what I do specifically is I look at the atmospheres of hot Jupiters with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so how I said earlier, the, one of the key things we want to measure in these planets' atmospheres is the amount of carbon and oxygen they have. And it turns out with the Hubble Space Telescope, we're able to measure um, the amount of oxygen in the planet's atmosphere through looking for water in the atmosphere. Um, so this is like the data we get out of um, the Hubble Space Telescope. These blue points here are some of the data we get. And you'll see we basically get like this plot is just showing you don't have to care what this axis is, but it's basically like an amount of light we're getting from the planet at all of these different wavelengths. And it turns out that when we look at planets' atmospheres, um, every different gas in the atmosphere will have its own unique fingerprint of different wavelengths where you can see that gas. Um, so it just so happens that um, the wavelengths that the Hubble Space Telescope observes at, we can see the fingerprint of water. Um, so this gray line here is just an example of what we might expect to see from this planet if there wasn't any water. And you can see this bump here where our data don't match that gray line. That's how we know there is water in the atmosphere of the planet. So basically what we can do is look for this bump in our data and then say, OK, a bigger bump means there's more water. A smaller bump means there's less water. So we can learn a little bit about how much water is in the atmosphere from that. Um, so then the second thing I said we want to measure is we want to get the temperature as a function of altitude in these planets. Um, so here I'm going to tell you about two different types of planets, um, and over here I'm showing some, uh, we call them temperature pressure profiles. Um, it's literally just the temperature of the planet at all of these different pressures, or you can, that's the same as altitude in an atmosphere, because as you go up in the atmosphere, the pressure is going to get smaller. So the top of this plot is the top of the atmosphere, and the bottom is the bottom of the atmosphere. Um, so there's two different types of atmospheres here. Um, these purple lines are something that we call non-inverted atmospheres, which basically just means as you go higher and higher up in the atmosphere, the temperature continues to get colder and colder. And then the second type, these orange ones, are what we call an inverted atmosphere, where at some point as we go higher and higher up in the atmosphere, the temperature begins to increase again. Um, and this inverted atmosphere effect actually happens in the Earth as well. Um, you probably have the most experience with this lower part of the Earth's atmosphere called the troposphere, where the temperature just goes down as you go higher up through the atmosphere, um, because you really don't get above that unless you're like on a plane or something. Um, but above that part of the Earth's atmosphere, there's another layer called the stratosphere, where the Earth's atmosphere has a thermal inversion. So the temperature starts to go up again as you go up in the atmosphere. All right, so um, here I'm showing so these, um, these are models for what we would expect to see on these planets. And again, here in this left panel, this is a mock-up of these bumps that we would be able to see in our Hubble Space Telescope data for non-inverted and inverted atmospheres. Um, so for these non-inverted atmospheres, which are these purple ones again, um, we see this bump pointing down. But for an inverted atmosphere, this is a little harder to see just because of the scaling of this plot, but you can actually see this bump um, pointing up. So we can use whether this bump is pointing down or pointing up 
to tell us a little bit about um, what the temperature structure of the atmosphere is like, whether it has an inversion where the temperature starts to increase again, or whether it doesn't and the temperature just keeps getting colder. Oops. All right, so to summarize that, there's kind of two pieces of information we can get from these Hubble Space Telescope observations of hot Jupiters. Um, we can measure the size of a bump that we see in our spectrum, which tells us the amount of water in the atmosphere. And we can measure the direction of the bump. Does it point down or does it point up to tell us whether the atmosphere is inverted or not? All right, so first here, I'm just plotting some models that we've made for what we expected to happen for hot Jupiters. Um, this gray line here is one set of models and everything shaded around it is a whole range of different models we put in with different conditions for what might happen in these planets' atmospheres. And um, as you go up on this plot, you're getting to higher and higher temperatures. And then the x-axis of this plot is something that I called water feature strength. And basically what you need to know about that is just um, positive values are a bump pointing down. So that would be a non-inverted atmosphere. Um, negative values are a bump pointing up. So that's an inverted atmosphere. And then as you go to bigger numbers, that's a bigger uh, feature that we're seeing, a bigger bump. So um, from these models, we expected that we might see at lower temperatures, we'd see this bump pointing down. So we'd see non-inverted atmospheres. And then at higher temperatures, we see this bump pointing up. So we see inverted atmospheres. All right, so now I'm gonna put on there a bunch of data that we got from the Hubble Space Telescope. So each of these points represents one of our individual planets that we looked at, an individual hot Jupiter. Um, and these error bars are um, from the measurements we took uh, from these hot Jupiters to figure out what the size and shape of this bump we were seeing in the spectrum was for each of these planets. And so you can see that actually our models do a pretty good job of predicting what we were expecting to see from these hot Jupiters, um, which is really cool because that means that we probably have a pretty good understanding of the main processes that are going on in these planets' atmospheres, like what drives the winds to act the way they do on the atmosphere and um, things like that, the big scale things that happen that um, affect these planets uh, globally. Um, but one thing that's hard to see directly from this plot is that um, there's actually a lot of variation in these, um, in these different measurements. So when you look at similar temperatures, you actually get a lot of planets with very different values for this water feature strength. And you can see our models, like if you look at this one track that's highlighted, they don't predict really big differences in this water feature strength at different temperatures. So these points are spread out a lot more than any single model predicted. And we think that these, the spread that we're seeing in these points is because these planets all have slightly different amounts of oxygen and carbon abundances. So um, as I said earlier, we can use the amount of oxygen and carbon in these planets' atmospheres to try and figure out something about how they formed. So we think what's going on here is that each of these planets has a slightly different amount of oxygen and carbon, which could point towards the idea that each of these planets formed in a slightly different way um, in, around their, uh, their own star. Um, so that was a quick summary of some work that I've been doing on these planets with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and really soon we're going to have the super exciting opportunity to study some of these hot Jupiters with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, so this is the next telescope that's coming after Hubble. Um, you all probably know it launched really successfully about um, a month ago and since then has been flying out to where it's going to park in space and getting unfolded and getting all its instruments set up. And this summer it should be taking the first ever data um, and some of that data is going to be on hot Jupiters. So the James Webb Space Telescope is going to tell us a lot more about these planets um, because the Hubble Space Telescope, we were able to learn a lot about them, but we were really only able to measure that one bump that's the fingerprint of water in these planets' atmospheres. And James Webb is going to look at a lot more wavelengths than Hubble looked at. And so it's going to be able to detect the fingerprints of lots more molecules, things like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, other things that have carbon and oxygen in them. 
And so that'll give us a much better handle on what these planets are made of, and we'll be able to learn a lot more maybe about how these planets formed. Um, so just to kind of conclude all of this, um, so hot Jupiters are gas giant exoplanets, gas giants around other stars that are so close into their stars that they can get up to temperatures of thousands of degrees. Um, we're interested in studying the atmospheres of hot Jupiters because that can help us understand a little more about how these planets formed and evolved. Um, and our research shows that um, we have a pretty good understanding of large scale things that happen in hot Jupiter atmospheres, which is pretty cool. Um, but we think there might be little differences in the abundances of different uh, elements in their atmospheres, which might point towards little differences in how these planets formed. And in the future, we're going to learn a lot more about these weird planets with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, so thanks again for inviting me. It's been really great to talk with you guys. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I also put my email and Twitter up here in case we don't have time to get to everyone's questions. Um, but yeah. Hey, um, yes, we do have a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, it's from Jim. And he says, what's the smallest planet size that we can detect? That's a good question. So we've detected planets that are as small as Mars, which is a little bit smaller than the Earth. So we can get pretty small planets the size of like Mars, Mercury. Um, we even uh, think someday this is not something we can detect now, but there are people who are working on trying to detect exomoons, which would be like moons around exoplanets. Um, so we can't do that yet, but people are working on it and hopefully someday we'll even be able to detect little moons around planets. Thank you. Um, Alan has a question. How do we know that hot Jupiters have liquid iron rain? Yeah, so this was a super cool measurement of, um, so there's one hot Jupiter that this definitely happens on. It maybe happens on others. Um, and so, okay, so when the planet's transiting, we can see the light coming through the atmosphere. Um, and basically what they did is they looked for the signature of iron in the atmosphere in one half of the planet's atmosphere and the other half of the planet's atmosphere. And one half of the atmosphere was warmer and one half was cooler. And so they saw iron vapor in one half of the atmosphere, the one that was hotter. And then the cooler side of the atmosphere, they couldn't see iron vapor anymore. So basically they think that that was like a cloud of iron vapor that rained out when it got to the cooler part, the same way that on Earth water evaporates and then it cools off in the upper atmosphere and rains down again as rain. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, we have questions from two Davids. The first one is, at what temperature does water decompose? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's actually, um, you can actually see that. Okay, so it's about at 3000 Kelvin. I don't know what the conversion is to Fahrenheit in my head. But the reason you can see that is because, so I said that these values on this plot, this shows you where we're seeing this bump due to water and we're seeing it pointing down here and we're seeing it pointing up here. And then you can see it around 3000 Kelvin. It all just kind of goes to zero, like you can't detect any water anymore. That's actually because the water molecules are breaking apart because they get so hot. Um, so when you get that hot, you don't get water anymore. Okay. Our second question from another David was, um, is, uh, was the first exoplanet ever discovered a hot Jupiter? So th that's a, that depends on <laughs> what you mean by the first exoplanet. So this planet uh, 51 Pegasi b is a hot Jupiter and it was the first exoplanet ever discovered around a star that's like the sun. There was a detection of an exoplanet before this one, um, but that was discovered around a weird type of star called a pulsar that's like a remnant of what a star might become after it's like gone through its whole lifetime and there's a lot of other stuff that happened. So that was basically a dead star with a planet orbiting it. Um, so that was cool because it was the first detection of another planet, but this was the first one that was really a planet in a system like our own solar system. Wonderful. Okay, that's the last question I see at this point. If anyone else has a question, would you right away enter it into the chat for us? 
And Terry, do we have all the Facebook questions now? We do. We, we do. do. Um, okay. Like there's more questions on Facebook. Uh, okay. Or not on Facebook and chat. I think I see a couple more on the chat. I can read one out if. Yeah, if you want to just go ahead and uh, ask the question and answer it. Oh, uh, okay. Here we go. There's one from Ray that says, how is the spatial resolution of pressure and temperature actually determined? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So um, in terms of like going up through the atmosphere at different altitudes, um, basically the amount of different like pressures you're able to look at in the atmosphere depends on um, how good your telescope is and how many different wavelengths you can look at. So kind of the more wavelengths you can look at, the more different pressures you can look at. Um, in terms of like looking at different like areas on the planet, like latitude and longitude, that's actually really hard because we're not um, seeing these planets as like a sphere that we can look at. We're just seeing a little point of light and we don't resolve that at all. Um, there are a couple ways that you can get like a little bit of information on different um, parts of the planet. Like, for example, I was saying earlier, they were able to detect that there's like iron on one half of the planet and not on the other half. Um, but it's very difficult to resolve like latitude and longitude. Like you probably couldn't tell the difference between, you know, definitely not Tucson and Phoenix, probably not even Tucson and Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Julie asked, how much hydrogen do you find in these hot Jupiters? Yeah, so hot Jupiters are basically just balls of gas. So they're like mostly hydrogen. Like um, all of the water in this would be like 0.1% other stuff. So they'll be like 97% hydrogen and a few percent helium and then like 0.1% everything else. So they're mostly hydrogen. Great. Ben asks, is it typical to have a mix of planet types, hot Jupiters and other types around stars? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So um, most of the time when we've found hot Jupiters, we actually don't see a lot of other planets in that same system. Um, but we have found a lot of other systems where we'll see like three or four rocky planets the size of Earth or planets a little bit bigger than the Earth. That's pretty common too. So one theory that people have for um, what happened with these hot Jupiters is maybe they started out at a distance like where Jupiter is further away from their star and then something caused them to like migrate in towards the star at some point. And as you can imagine, a giant planet like Jupiter migrating in towards the inner solar system, that would really screw things up for the orbits of the other planets. And so it's possible that these Jupiters moving around and getting closer to the stars might have knocked out any other planets that existed in those systems. Interesting. OK, Richard would like to know, how do you determine temperature of different parts of a planet? Um, yeah, so basically what we do is we um, look at um, the amount of heat that the planet's emitting. Um, so those Hubble Space Telescope observations that I was showing, let me go back to that if I can, there we go. Um, so this is observing at wavelengths that we call the near infrared, um, basically just a little bit outside what our eyes can see, a little bit redder than red. And um, the infrared is wavelengths where um, warm things emit heat at. Like if you've ever played with like, there's infrared cameras where you can like watch your body light up. Um, so you can detect heat with these. So basically looking at the near infrared, we're able to see the amount of heat that's coming from these planets. So we can use that to get their temperature. And then the same way that different wavelengths um, can probe different um, pressures on the, in the planet's atmosphere, that means then we can get like, different temperatures of different pressures throughout the atmosphere. Okay, um, we have another question in the chat from Matt. And he says, is there anything particularly interesting about the gravity influence of hot Jupiters being so close to their star, such as one massive object, and being massive itself? 
Yeah, so um, the weirdest thing, yeah, so there's definitely interesting stuff that happens there because they're so close to each other and so massive. Um, there's actually a few hot Jupiters we know of that are so close to their stars that they actually start to get distorted. So instead of being spherical like most planets are, they end up in these like football shapes um, with like a point pointing towards the sun. And then some people think it's possible that um, like hot Jupiters being so close into their stars, they could also have an impact on the stars. Um, so stars make, um, they're called stellar flares. Basically, they just like put out big amounts of energy sometimes and sometimes even eject a bunch of particles off of the sun. Um, and it's possible that they might like flare differently um, because there is something so massive so close to them that influences how everything operates in the star. Gary asked, with the JWST coming online, will there be any features you hope to see or find that you might have been missing with Hubble? Yeah, so the thing I'm the most excited about is, um, so I said earlier that oxygen and carbon are important for understanding how these planets formed. And with Hubble, we can get water, um, but we can't really get anything that has carbon in it. So we're kind of stuck there just trying to like infer what might be happening with the carbon based on what's happening with the water. And with JWST, we're gonna be able to get things like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, things that have carbon and oxygen in them. And so we'll actually be able to uh, figure out both carbon and oxygen uh, for these planets, which will give us much more information on how they formed. Stephen on Facebook would like to know, when 51 Pegasi B was found, did they create a separate nickname for it? And what is the maximum temperature a hot Jupiter can reach? You know, I think 51 Pegasi B does have a nickname, but I don't remember what it's called. But I think if you look it up on Wikipedia, it does have an unofficial nickname. <laughs> um, and for the maximum temperature a hot Jupiter can reach, um, so the hottest one we know of is um, about 4000 Kelvin um, and basically the limit there is just like a like a planet really close into its star will be hotter, but eventually if you get too close you're just going to fall into the star and burn up and so that hottest planet that we know of is um, as close in as possible almost around a star that's about twice as big as the sun and so it's also hotter than the sun. Um, so we don't know of any hot Jupiters yet. There are stars that are even bigger than that. So it's possible that you could, um, it's possible that you could make a hotter hot Jupiter by putting it around one of those bigger stars. But those bigger stars are pretty rare in the galaxy. So we haven't found that many planets around them yet. Harry would like to know, <laughs> how useful is Jupiter and Saturn as models? for your research since they aren't close to the sun. Yeah, they're still super useful actually. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that we've learned from Jupiter and Saturn that can be really helpful for hot Jupiters as well. Um, so a lot of that has to do with things like um, how the interiors of those planets work. They all work pretty similar once you get deep enough inside, even though at the outside their temperatures are so different. Um, so like one thing is uh, since they're mostly made of hydrogen, eventually you get to a point deep 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 in their atmospheres where the hydrogen instead of acting like a gas it almost starts to act like a fluid or um they call it metallic hydrogen but it starts to act more like a liquid than a gas and studying jupiter and saturn has taught us a lot about how hydrogen works deep in the inside of these planets and that's probably the same as what it is for um exoplanets um terry Additionally ask, how might Jupiter and Saturn change if they were close to the sun? Yeah, so um, they'd get pretty similar to the hot Jupiters we see right now, we think. Um, and one thing that's actually really interesting about hot Jupiters is you might think that anything that we could learn from them would be way inferior to what you could learn from 
a uh, planet that's in the solar system. Um, but it turns out it's actually really, really hard to measure the amount of water in Jupiter because Jupiter is so cold that all the water turns into ice and condenses out of the atmosphere and we can't see it from outside the atmosphere. We'd have to actually send a probe into the atmosphere to try and measure it. And we've done that a couple times, but it's much more difficult than um, just on the hot Jupiters where all the water is a uh, gas in the atmosphere and it's much easier to detect it that way. Um, Gary comments that astronomers called uh, 51 Pegasus B by other names. It was dubbed Bellerfon by astronomer uh, Jeffrey Marcy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I knew it had a nickname. <laughs> um, and Jim asked, how much of the information you collect on hot Jupiters is spectroscopic versus visual? Yeah, so most of um, what I do is looking at spectroscopic information, um, but there's a lot of stuff you can learn from uh, just looking at them like visual as well. Um, so it's kind of, you can kind of think of, of it as two complementary areas to study these. I take like, you know, one, two, maybe like 10 maximum of these planets and do this really deep dive by looking at them spectroscopically. And then there are other people who will look at thousands of planets, um, not spectra, just looking at them visually. Um, but then they can get a really good idea of like, on a large scale, what is the population of all of these planets? Like in terms of things that you can measure just visually, like the radius of these planets and their mass. Um, so, yeah. And Celeste on Facebook asks, any idea how long hot Jupiters exist on average? Yeah, so um, all of the uh, stars that these planets are around, they're pretty like our sun. Um, so our sun is about 5 billion years old now, and it's probably going to be around for another 5 billion years. Um, and all the planets in our solar system are almost as old as the sun. They probably formed like a few uh, million years after the sun formed. Um, and so we think that um, hot Jupiters are pretty similar. They basically can stick around for their whole star's lifetime. So there might be some that um, their stars are pretty young now and they're only a few hundred million years or a billion years old. And then there might be some that we'll find that are um, several billion years old. Okay, I think Dr. Mansfield, that was the last question. I don't see any more. Um, so thank you so much for being here tonight. We enjoyed this so much. And so our members will know um, we've invited Dr. Facebook, Dr. Mansfield to come sometime later as um, she's not getting to visit with us in person tonight in a, in a small group setting and chat with you about questions that you might have otherwise. Um, but she will, she has promised that she'll come back and talk with us again another time and, and then spend some more personal time with us as well. So thank you very much um, for, for your really wonderful, interesting presentation and all your attention to our questions tonight. We appreciate that. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yes, thank you. Um, and I want to say goodbye to our Facebook people. We really appreciate your coming tonight. We do have some more activities for our members tonight, but we will close out our Facebook activities. And we hope that you will visit us on our website and um, look at all the interesting things that we have there. And we hope that you will come and visit us at another meeting. And um, of course, on our website, you have the option to, um, to join the club and you have the option to donate to us. And we would just appreciate any interest that you have in our club. We hope to see you again later. So thank you so much. Thank you.